Brianna Dennison, 19, was known for being security conscious. A sophomore psychology student at Santa Barbara City College, she had returned to her Reno, Nevada home for winter break and planned to attend a number of events associated with the SWAT 72 Snowboarding Festival on Saturday night, January 19, 2008, before heading back to college the next week. She made a list of the events she was planning to attend, gave it to her mother, and informed her that she would be ending the night at the home of a friend, K.T. Hunter, also 19. Dennison, Hunter, and one of Hunter's housemates then proceeded to the SWAT events, ending with an early breakfast at Mel's Diner inside the Sands Regency Casino Hotel. It was about 4 a.m. when Brianna and Hunter returned home, dropped off by four male companions who drove away as the two young women entered the house. Hunter's housemate had returned hours earlier and had already gone to bed. After they changed into sleeping attire, Hunter gave Dennison two blankets, a pillow and a teddy bear to bolster the pillow. Dennison slept on the leather sofa downstairs while Hunter retired to her bedroom that she shared with another girl. She took her dog with her and locked the bedroom door behind her. The five-foot, 98-pound Dennison presumably went to sleep on the sofa in view of a glass-paneled front door left unlocked as Hunter and the other girls living in the house typically left their doors. When Hunter awoke some five hours later and began looking for her friend, all she found was a silver dollar-sized bloodstain on the pillow that investigators would later determine had come from Dennison. Someone walked into my house and took my friend and did God knows what with her, Hunter said later. It seems unreal. She is the nicest person, honest to God. She has such a good heart. It's so sad this happened. Hunter, who had been friends with Dennison since high school, told police officers that she had not heard any noises after going to bed that Sunday morning and that her dog had never barked. She explained that when she discovered that Dennison was gone, she had telephoned Dennison's mother and then called the police. There were no signs of forced entry. There also were no signs of a struggle inside the home. Perplexed by the attractive blue-eyed brunette's disappearance and deeply concerned that no one had heard from her, Hunter and Dennison's family members worked assiduously to assist the police with their investigation. Police, including Lieutenant Robert MacDonald, head of the Robbery Homicide Unit, and Detective David Jenkins, a 32-year veteran of the department, inspected the burnt orange two-story rental house on the 1300 block of McKay Court, near the UNR, University of Nevada, Reno campus, shortly after the first investigating officers had arrived to begin what initially had seemed to be a simple missing person case. Soon it became clear that it would be much more than that. Upon awakening and realizing that Dennison was missing from the residence under suspicious circumstances, Hunter and one of her roommates told the detectives they had observed that one of the two blankets provided to Dennison remained on the couch, but that the second blanket was lying on the floor of the kitchen, roughly six feet from the sofa and along the path to the rear door of the house. Detective Jenkins observed that the blanket had a small blood stain on it. Strangely, the teddy bear was missing. As Jenkins walked through the house, he observed that the windows and doors had few coverings, and several provided an unobstructed view inside the house from Mackay Court, as well as from adjacent College Drive. Anyone choosing to look inside the windows early that morning likely could have seen Dennison lying on the sofa as she slept. Jenkins also noted the pillow on the couch that was smeared with blood and mascara. There were three distinct blood stains transfers on the same side of the pillow and oriented below the mascara stains, according to the detective's report. Each of the stains was irregular in shape, approximately one to three inches in diameter, and it was determined that one of the stains contained saliva mixed with mucus or phlegm. Later, all of the blood stains were identified by DNA analysis as belonging to Brianna Dennison. Following additional analysis, forensic pathologists concluded that Dennison appeared to have suffered an actively bleeding injury in or near her mouth, throat or nose at a time when her face was being pressed hard against the pillow, Jenkins said.
Investigators also obtained a substance from the doorknob of the rear door that later yielded an unidentified male DNA profile. Had the rear door been the suspect's entrance to the house or his exit with Denison, or both? Denison had left her identification wallet, cellular phone and shoes behind and was likely barefoot when she left the house. According to Hunter, she was last wearing a white tank top with pink angel wings and rhinestones with the word Bindi imprinted on the back. She also may have been wearing sweatpants, either pink or light blue. Jenkins noted that Denison had sent and received multiple text messages in the time leading up to her disappearance, the last one at 4.23 a.m. It was later determined that she had been communicating with a former boyfriend who was living in Oregon. Police emphasized that the former boyfriend was not a suspect. He had been in Oregon at the time of her disappearance. Reno police continued their search for Denison for the next several days, using search crews, dogs and helicopters to comb the areas near UNR, the surrounding snowy foothills and other isolated areas in the vicinity. Uniformed officers also went door to door throughout the neighborhood in an effort to find someone who may have seen or heard something suspicious around the time Denison disappeared, but they failed to turn up anything significant. They also searched other areas around Reno, including along the Truckee River that runs through the center of town and along the Union Pacific Railroad tracks, to no avail. The suspicious male DNA did not yield any hits in any law enforcement databases, indicating that the apparent abductor was not a known registered sex offender. In the aftermath of Denison's disappearance, literally hundreds of volunteers showed up daily at the Brianna Search Operations Center, set up inside a local casino. Flyers, along with blue ribbons that said, Got Brie, were distributed, and volunteers braved the harsh, cold weather of the northern Nevada winter each day to conduct grid searches in designated areas, all to no avail. Even Governor Jim Gibbons's wife, Dawn Gibbons, joined in the effort to look for clues, such as clothing or other evidence that might shed light on what had happened to Denison. As a mother of a child nearly the same age as Brianna, Miss Gibbons, whose son had attended high school with Denison, said, My heart goes out to the entire Denison family. I continue to be impressed by the overwhelming community support and many volunteers dedicated to the ongoing search efforts. This tragic case has touched the hearts of so many across the state. Despite the best efforts of everyone involved in the search for Denison, detectives knew that time would soon be working against them if it wasn't already. It is hugely important to solve a case like this in the first 24 to 36 hours, Reno Police Commander Ron Holliday said. Every bit after that reduces our chances of finding her alive. Denison's relatives described her as a responsible and caring young woman and maintained that she would have contacted them if she could. Their fear for her well-being increased with each passing hour. As investigators worked to determine what had happened to Brianna Dennison, they examined earlier non-lethal attacks against young college girls in the area for links to the disappearance, either physical evidence, a suspect's modus operandi, or both. In the early morning hours of December 16, 2007, Reno police officer Andrew Hickman and several other officers had been dispatched to an address in the 1400 block of North Virginia Street to take a complaint from a young woman who had been kidnapped and sexually assaulted. The woman explained that she lived alone in an apartment in the immediate vicinity and that she had arrived in her vehicle at approximately 2 a.m., as she exited her vehicle in the apartment complex's parking lot, she said she had been physically assaulted by a stranger who knocked her to the ground and attempted to choke her with her right arm. Failing in that effort, he had placed his hand over her nose and mouth, causing her to pass out. He had then taken her to a nearby pickup truck and forced her inside. He had covered her face with a hooded sweatshirt. Her assailant, had then driven a short while, perhaps three or four minutes, stopped in a dark and secluded area, and told her, If you see my face, if you tell the police, I will kill you, before sodomizing her. When he had finished his sexual assault, 
he drove her back to her residence, keeping the panties that she had been wearing and telling her that he might be back. The victim told the investigators that her assailant was wearing a red short-sleeve shirt with a blue neckline and a slick finish like silk or polyester. She thought the shirt might have had a word embroidered on the upper left breast. She recalled that the attacker wore pants like sports pants made out of soft material with an elastic waistband but no zipper. She also said that she had seen a baby shoe on the front seat floorboard. The victim was examined for evidence of sexual attack and several swabs were submitted to the Washoe County Crime Laboratory for analysis. The lab established the presence of a foreign Y-chromosome male DNA profile. The victim's clothing was also examined and grey fibre consistent in appearance with that of automobile carpeting was found. Most compelling of all, the DNA profile matched that of the DNA profile in the Brianna Dennison case. Detective Jenkins noted that the December attack had occurred in the same neighborhood from which Dennison had been abducted at a location less than 500 yards away. During follow-up interviews with the December victim, Jenkins learned that the attacker had been a white male, likely between the ages of 20 and 30 years old, between 5'9 and 6'3 in height, with a large or somewhat heavy build and brown hair. He was described as having thick, meaty fingers and spoke clear, fluent English with no discernible regional dialect or accent. The December sexual assault had not been the only such crime committed against an area woman. At approximately 5 p.m. on November 13, 2007, a 21-year-old female UNR student had been walking through the parking lot of an apartment complex in the 1400 block of College Drive when an unknown male approached her from behind and placed her in a chokehold. The attacker dragged the victim between cars and at one point pushed her to the ground and groped her. She fought back, screaming despite the suspect's commands for silence. Apparently fearing her noise would draw attention, the attacker kicked the victim in the head and arm and then ran away, leaving behind a few packages of unopened condoms. DNA evidence from that assault was linked as well to the December assault and to Denison's disappearance. Another earlier attack, which had occurred on October 22, 2007, against another female UNR student in a UNR parking garage, was also considered possibly linked to the other assaults. In that case, a UNR student had been raped in the parking garage Detectives said that the circumstances of the assault and the attacker's method of operation were similar to the other cases, but the October case was not immediately connected to the others. Reno investigators told America's Most Wanted the suspect appeared to be seeking dominance and power over his victims, escalating in the severity of his attacks. All of the female victims were similar in appearance, petite with long straight hair. The December victim told Detective Jenkins that the vehicle into which she had been forced was a late-model pickup truck with an extended cab. It had reclining bucket seats, grey or black upholstery, and carpeting, a narrow raised center console with a hinged lid between the seats, and adjustable headrests. The truck had an automatic transmission, and the victim had noticed that the interior cab lights were located above the rearview mirror. It also required a big step up to get inside. Jenkins took the vehicle's description to a number of local automotive collision repair businesses and discovered that a number of Toyota Tacoma four-wheel drive pickups made between 2001 and 2006 matched the description. After additional interviews with the victims of the previous attacks, the Reno Police Department revised their suspect's description. He was now believed to be in his early twenties to mid-thirties, and the skin of his abdomen, groin and upper legs was noticeably lighter than that of his hands and forearms. He wore a moustache and a goatee, with a gap where there was no hair between the ends of the moustache and the top of the goatee. His groin was also described as being without hair, as if hair removal cream or some similar process of hair removal had been used. By the third week in the search for Denison, Reno police estimated that they had received more than 1,000 tips that they were continuing to pursue. However, 
On Saturday, February 16, 2008, their search for Denison came to an end. A woman's body found lying in a field in South Reno the previous day was positively identified as Brianna Denison. According to the autopsy report, she died of strangulation. Because the area had previously been covered in snow, police believe the body had been there for more than a week, possibly longer. The location was about eight miles from Hunter's home, where Denison had last been seen. Two pairs of women's thong-style panties were found beneath one of Denison's legs, containing male and female DNA profiles that did not match Denison's DNA profile. One of the panties, however, contained the same DNA profile of the still unidentified attacker. Swabs taken from the victim revealed the presence of semen, and DNA tests showed that the profile obtained from the semen was consistent with the unknown male profile that had been obtained from the rear door of the house from which Denison had been abducted and with that obtained from the two prior attacks. There was no longer any question that Reno had a serial rapist on its hands, one that had escalated to homicide. A week after her body was found, a Leave, Love and Unite ceremony was held at the Reno Sparks Convention Center in memory of Brianna Dennison. More than 3,000 mourners attended as police continued the search for her killer. Police advised people to be aware that the attacker's behavior and appearance might have changed since the discovery of Dennison's body, noting that such changes would be apparent to people who were close to him. They asked anyone noticing unusual behavior or someone making marked appearance changes to contact the police. By early April 2008, police had received more than 4,000 tips in the case, but none of them had led to a suspect. The Regional Sex Offender Unit, which comprises officers from the Reno and Sparks Police Departments and the Washoe County Sheriff's Office, interviewed 100 sex offenders residing within a mile of the McKay Court residence and contacted more than 1,700 registered sex offenders living in Washoe County, creating a backlog in DNA processing. Funds were quickly raised to help speed up the process, but a suspect remained elusive. On November 1, 2008, the Reno Police Department received a report from an anonymous caller through the secret witness tip line that a man by the name of James Biela, 27, was exhibiting strange behavior and fit some of the suspect criteria that police had developed in the various cases over the past year. Detective Adam Wignansky was assigned to follow up on the tip and met with Biela on November 7th. Vignansky explained to Biella that he was working on the Brianna Dennison case and that Biella's name had come up along with a number of other male subjects. He asked Biella for a saliva swab to eliminate him as a suspect, but Biella refused to provide it. Vignansky noted that Biella was very nervous during their meeting and would not make eye contact with him. Vignansky also observed that Biela matched the physical characteristics of the attacker provided by the December 2007 victim. Before the interview concluded, Vignansky confronted Biela with reports that Biela had worked as a pipe fitter on a construction project on the UNR campus, but Biela denied them. Although Wignansky determined that Biela was the registered owner and frequent driver of a 2006 four-wheel drive Toyota Tacoma pickup truck with an extended cab with grey-coloured interior during the time frame of the sexual assaults and Brianna's disappearance, Biela denied having anything to do with Denison's murder and he claimed that his girlfriend, who was also the mother of his child, would provide him with an alibi for his whereabouts at the time of Denison's disappearance. Wignansky, lacking physical evidence that would ensure a conviction, had little choice but to let Biela go. Born June 29, 1981, in Chicago, Illinois, James Michael Biela was nine when his family moved to Reno. Later, he could be the life of a party or a barroom gathering, known as a funny guy who took martial arts classes. But he was also known to have a quick temper, and some described him as a bully. He joined the Marine Corps after high school and was promoted to the rank of Lance Corporal, but was discharged in 2001 for drug use. 
In 2002, upon his return to Reno, Biela came to the attention of authorities when he drunkenly threatened a former girlfriend's neighbor with a knife and was arrested. The former girlfriend filed for a restraining order against him, and he pleaded guilty in April 2003 to a misdemeanor charge involving the knife incident. Biela was sentenced to alcohol counseling and ordered to have no contact with the victim for a year, but no DNA samples were collected because the plea was only a misdemeanor. Following his earlier run-ins with the law, Biela lived with a new girlfriend in Sparks, east of Reno, and they had a son together. Neighbors described him as a nice, normal guy, and no one noticed anything peculiar about him, even the police officers who trained alongside him in martial arts classes. On November 12, 2008, Detectives Jenkins and Wignanski met with Biela's girlfriend. During the interview, she said that she had been involved with Biela for the previous six years and confirmed that they'd had a child together who was four. However, although they had been living together, the girlfriend could not account for Biela's whereabouts during the early morning hours of December 16, 2007 or on January 20, 2008. She said that their relationship had been tumultuous at times and that it had not been uncommon for Biela to leave their residence for days at a time during the time frame in which the detectives were interested. She said that he claimed that he had been sleeping in his vehicle during the absences. Between March and September 2008, she said, Biela had left the Reno area to work as a pipe fitter in the state of Washington and sold his Toyota Tacoma pickup, replacing it with another vehicle. When Biela had decided to move back to the Reno area, his girlfriend recounted, she had traveled to Washington to help him make the move. While with him there, she said, she had discovered petite women's thong panties inside his vehicle. When she confronted him about them, he told her he had stolen them from a woman at a laundromat in Washington. Biela's girlfriend then volunteered to provide a DNA saliva sample from Biela's son so that it could be compared to the DNA evidence that had been developed during the course of the investigation. Both Jenkins and Wignanski witnessed the DNA reference sample as it was collected from the child. Afterward, the detectives delivered it to the Washoe County Crime Laboratory. On November 25, 2008, after comparing the child's DNA profile to that of the suspect's DNA profile, it was determined that James Biela could not be excluded from the suspect's DNA profile and that the child was closely related to the suspect in Brianna Dennison's death. Biela was subsequently arrested at a South Reno daycare center when he arrived to pick up his child and was booked into the Washoe County Jail on charges of murder, first-degree kidnapping, and sexual assault. Once police had Biela in custody, they obtained a court order for a sample of his DNA and announced the following day that his DNA matched the suspect's DNA. With the DNA results finally available, Biela was then charged with raping a UNR student in one of the university's parking garages and with the December 2007 kidnapping and sexual assault of the other UNR student in December 2007. Biela's trial for the abduction and murder of Brianna Dennison was held in May 2010. On May 27, a Washoe County District Court jury found James Biela guilty of all five counts in the murder of Brianna Dennison and sexual assault of two other young women. On June 2, 2010, Biela was sentenced to death. Biela filed an appeal with the Nevada Supreme Court to overturn the rejection of his 2012 writ of habeas corpus by the Washoe County Second Judicial District Court. On June 12, 2019, the Nevada Supreme Court reviewed Biela's arguments and determined that they did not justify granting relief. Consequently, the court upheld the district court's judgment, affirming their previous decision. 